The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone. Um, this is Sue Meyer from the Ohio Facilities Construction Commission. I'll be your hostess today for the Safety and Security in 21st Century Facilities webinar. Um, we've got a few housekeeping items to go over this morning. Some of you may be familiar with these, and for that we apologize. But for those who are not familiar with our Certificate of Participation process um, for our webinars, um, please know that if you're interested in receiving AIA CEU units, for which this uh, webinar it has 1.0 HSW points available, or a Certificate of Participation, um, you need to individually register, log in, and log out. Um, we, that way we get a log in and a log out. Um, and just to let you know um, that we do not um, issue certificates of participation for those who watch this in a group environment. If you want credit, you must, in, you must watch in an individual environment. Um, and if you want credit, we will walk through the process for that during this webinar. All right, so if you are someone who needs to self-report, um, at the end of the email, at the, excuse me, at the end of the presentation, there will be a slide that says this concludes the AIA presentation. It is at that point and that point only that you send me an email requesting your certificate of attendance. Please include your AIA number if you are that. If not, one is not needed. I'm going to go through a few slides here that are required for AIA. These are required slides. This is our webinar description that you received earlier. Our, our learning objectives for today's webinar. And yes, this webinar is being recorded. We will find a copy of the recording as well as the PowerPoint slides up on the OFCC webinar archive within five business days, most likely sooner than that. But you will receive an email letting you know that that is available. If you have a question at any time during the webinar, please use the question feature which is located on the right side of your screen. Responses will be provided at the end of this webinar. Right now I'd like to introduce Melanie Jurek, who is a planning manager at OSTC, who will introduce our guest speakers today. Good morning, Melanie. Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone today. Uh, we have two phenomenal speakers with us today. Uh, Gary Armbruster. Gary is an educational facility planner and principal architect with MA Plus Architecture in Oklahoma City. He's a Sooner with a degree in both sociology and architecture from the University of Oklahoma. Gary has also achieved an advanced certificate in educational facility design from San Diego State University. Gary serves on the Oklahoma School Security Commission. We also have Frank Locker. Uh, Dr. Locker has taught at the university level. He's a trained facilitator and a registered architect. He was honored as a Planner of the Year by the Council of Educational Facility Planners International, and he is a frequent speaker at international, national, and regional school planning conferences. Frank is an affiliate of the Partnership for 21st Century Skills. Frank will begin with a presentation on the history and future of school design. Talk about the session agenda. This is Gary Armbruster. We're going to go through, and we've talked about the introductions. Um, Frank's going to talk about the history and future of school design. I will then go into the history of school violence. And then I'll go over some SEPTED principles, and that's crime prevention through environmental design. And then at the end of our presentation, we'll go through our questions and answer session. Next slide. Yeah. Thank you, Gary. Um, I'm going to start uh, by talking about education and then segue into uh, what that means for facilities. Here's a, a short history of American public schools. Um, starting 100 years ago and transitioning to what I think characterizes many schools today, particularly the high schools. That shot was taken about a year ago in almost any high school in America. However, at the same time, we 
are doing these practices in the United States. We've got students collaborating. We've got students hunkering down for long-term projects. We've got frequent presentations. And we've got uh, spaces for students to do deep, deep learning with each other enhanced by technology. These shifts are characterized very briefly on this chart uh, with 21st century learning, what I call 20th century learning on the left-hand side and 21st century on the right. I characterize 20th century as primarily teacher-centered, and what we are shifting to now is a model of student-centered learning. You can read this while I'm speaking, but uh, just to highlight a couple, we've shifted from focusing on teaching efficiency to focusing on learning effectiveness. We're moving from broadcast teaching to, to um, personalizing learning. We're shifting from students working alone to collaborative learning. We're shifting from subjects taught separately to integrated and interdisciplinary learning, and from direct instruction to project-based learning. Graphically, that's indicated by the diagram at the bottom. We've shifted from batching our students in groups of, uh, what, 20 to 30, and sometimes 35 students, to much smaller groups uh, where uh, the teacher might be in the room with the students, or in fact, the students might be working in a space adjacent to where the teacher is and working on their own. Uh, in the course of a day, uh, a student's experience might include uh, activities like those on the left, but also activities on the right. And in fact, in the course of a single class period, we may be wanting to do a little bit on the left and a little bit on the right. This presents challenges to facilities that we've never seen before and opens up lots of opportunities. So facilities are shifting. Uh, we're looking for small learning communities. We're looking to interconnect the spaces because we're going to have students moving from space to space. Uh, we need flexibility for various modalities of teaching and learning. We want to make the spaces much more efficient. And instead of having circulation spaces as only for walking, uh, we want to have learning in the circulation spaces. And for a variety of reasons, including disruption and bullying problems, we want to have minimal movement across the overall building. And lastly, I wanted to cite this lastly, it's in the middle of the list there, but glass. We're looking for visual connections between spaces, something we've never, ever wanted before. These shifts are caused by or conditioned by a, a, a number of concepts uh, related to educational theory. One of them is the learning pyramid, uh, or characterized by the learning pyramid. This, the diagram on the right characterizes a variety of different practices, different educational deliveries. And it basically is saying that our two most traditional methods of learning, lecturing and reading, have the least amount of retention. And as students do much more active learning, including practice and teaching others, their retention increases phenomenally. We also know that learning is a relationship activity. When students are well known by their peers and by teachers, their learning goes up, so group size becomes very important. The number 150 appears over and over again as the maximum group size where everybody can know everybody else. So instead of planning our buildings based on grade level or curriculum, we're starting to plan our buildings to create better relationships. Within the last 10 years, the concepts of portable skills that are going to serve students uh, in this fast-changing world has, has risen to the top of consideration among educators. The Partnership for 21st Century Skills uh, came out with a construct in 2008, and it featured the four C's. So we're now looking for our students to learn skills in addition to content knowledge. Those include creativity, critical thinking, communication, and collaboration. Several of these challenge the traditional ways of making buildings, particularly the collaboration component, because we're now wanting students to be working together. The learning pyramid noted that active learning is more effective learning. And one of the best ways to do active learning is to do project-based learning. 
project-based learning also improves test scores and uh, much uh, and improves our reasoning capabilities. Unfortunately, it's hard to keep projects contained into our traditional ways of making school classrooms, and they also then challenge our way of making buildings. One of the more popular concepts for project-based learning is STEM, science, technology, engineering, math. And of course, if you add the arts to it, you get STEAM. Uh, these photos here characterize STEM learning, project learning in two high-achieving high schools. But small spaces like this with different technology needs, different noise uh, uh, possibilities, and different degrees of connections also challenge the traditional ways of making our school buildings. So I'm going to show you some diagrams that capture these thoughts that I've just been sharing with you. These thoughts are all related to how we make classrooms and where students do their learning. The photo on the left and the photo on the right both show kids doing collaborative learning in different settings. Unfortunately, both of these are illegal. The one on the left is in a stair tower. The one on the right is students laying out large sheets of paper in the middle of a corridor. We've got to have a better way to do this work. So our traditional concept of making schools is to have classrooms and a corridor. Classrooms are the rectangles with the C's in them, and the corridor is the orange line between them. This would be a small school, perhaps 150 to 200 students. And by our traditional methods of thinking, if we have a large school, it would look like this. And we would just simply keep adding rooms until we ran out of students. This concept works when we have separate curriculums delivered by individual teachers in isolated settings. This characterizes probably 95% of the schools we have in America and, I would say, 90% of the new schools that we're building today. This is the planning pattern that is the basis for most thinking about safety and security in schools because it is the concept we hold when we think of lockdown. However, as education is shifting, our concepts for making spaces is shifting, and it's moving towards a model of suites of spaces with collaborative teachers. Those spaces within the suite may not all look alike. And the circulation, instead of being long and drawn out, is compact and lends itself for use for learning. So it's more than just movement, it's learning as well. If we have a larger school, we would have multiple small learning communities or multiple clusters. And lockdown, in this case, would happen zone by zone, not necessarily room by room. And that's because those edges of the rooms may have a lot of glass, they may have opening walls, folding partitions, etc. Here's a diagram that characterizes it as, a, as an accent metric, uh, showing a grouping of classrooms around a commons or a breakout room in a strategically located teacher planning center, kind of the nerve center of the grouping of about uh, eight classrooms. Here's a floor plan of a renovation recently completed in Grand Rapids that characterizes the shift very graphically. The plan on the left was the 1960s plan that we started out with. You see it's got the traditional corridor and highly separated classrooms, with no connections between them. The plan on the right is where the school wanted to go with an open, flexible learning space where students could be learning in different modalities. The plan on the right is the one they settled on because they weren't ready yet educationally to go to the right. But they made the plans within the building to shift over time by removing partitions. So here we have, to the greatest extent possible, a creation of a cluster out of a wing and the creation of a central common space out of what had been classrooms before. But there's other aspects of 21st century learning that challenge our traditional ways of making building. One is recognizing that learning is a social activity. Students have a life outside of class. Here at High Tech High, it shows the walkway, the circulation spaces that are used for social reasons um, all times of the day, but they're also used as breakout spaces um, for two teachers and students uh, when they're coming and going in and out of the classrooms. We know that learning is best when it's made visible. 
High Tech High, again, on the left, has classrooms that are virtually all glass. And as you can see, they use the glass to hold the student projects. On the right-hand side are trophies for education. This is in a school in London where students regularly build competitive cars and then display them throughout the walkway system in, in various parts of the building. This example from the government of Victoria, Australia, shows a concept of a media center or a library which characterizes 21st century thinking. The library is no longer a go-to place with walls and lots of books and high degree of control, but it's now a go-through place serving classrooms, operating as a flexible zone, and in some cases challenging our traditional concepts of security. I'm going to show you several slides of a, of a wing of an elementary school that was converted from 20th century thinking to 21st century thinking just a couple of years ago. The solid black lines indicate what we started with, a grouping of six classrooms in a corridor. And we shifted it to create an open space in the middle that was shared by all the teachers in this zone. In addition to that space called project and tutorial area, there's a zone to the right-hand side with stage, carpeting, and an extension of the commons. All of this was managed, if you will, by the teacher center, a collaborative working spot for the teachers that work here. And they, in fact, share all of the students that are in this grouping. So there's probably 90 students and four teachers and specialists. There are also barn doors between the rooms. And there are glass windows between the rooms and between the commons areas. So this is, in essence, a suite of interrelated spaces with students flowing from space to space as they are grouped and regrouped by the teachers who work together. So in the course of a day, a student might be working in one of the classrooms at the back of the diagram for, say, a half hour or 20 minutes, and then may move to the central zone, the commons, other students may move from one classroom to another. In the morning, all of the students in here have a group activity, and that takes place in the commons and then the stage, and then at the end of the day, they do another closing activity. So the student's life here, and this is for kindergartners, first and second graders, the student's life here is characterized by a whole lot more movement than we're used to in our traditional classrooms. The teacher's life is characterized by working with other teachers. This idea is carried out also in the high school. This is the Milan Michigan Center for Innovative Studies. It's an addition to a fairly large high school, and it, it's an addition focused on project-based learning. What you're looking at are spaces that, I would say, have replaced the classroom concept. In the upper left is a room that they call the design studio. In the upper right are collaboration booths. They're along a walkway, but they allow groups of six to eight students to hunker down with their technology and their laptops and work together. On the lower left is a maker space for students doing prototyping, making things that, that express their learning. And on the lower right is the circulation, which in a lot of ways looks more like a Starbucks or an airport departure lounge and allows students to work individually and in small groups have discussions and make a bit of noise as is necessary in order to do their learning. A couple more photographs of the Innovation Center. Uh, upper left are one of the several classrooms that they have. They're double-sized classrooms with a folding wall, and as you can see, loaded with lots of technology. Lower left is another aspect of the classroom with students with flexible seating and a very very large uh, window opening to the corridor. Upper right is another aspect of the circulation, with students working individually in different modalities, space for hunkering down with computers on the left on a uh, high counter, and in the center, uh, softer seats for individual study or, or group discussions. And then on the lower right, the science labs, which are all applied 
technology labs as well. And the plan diagram shows the variety of spaces uh, operating out of the teacher Yeah, I'd lost audio for a second. All right, let's check that out. Sorry for the... Here we go. Okay, Gary. I'm not saying anything. All right. Let me, can you send that back to me? We apologize for any technological issues we're having today. Could you send the keyboard back to me, please? All right, let's try this again. All right, here we go. Okay, Gary, you're you're on. Okay, I'm not seeing anything on my end. All right, well, we have the screen up on ours, so we have the history of school violence. I Bye. do not see that. I'm not quite sure why you don't. Hope, let me check to see if everybody else okay. is. Okay, it's up. It's up. Sorry okay. for that. Okay. It's not a problem. There we go. Next, Sorry, next. audience. Yeah. Um, the Scary Arm Brewster with MA Plus Architecture. I want to talk about uh, briefly about the history of school violence. Uh, some There's some statistics to the right that show that there's a, a history of school violence even as early as the 1900s with school shootings. And the lower right-hand uh, slide or picture shows uh, sort of a more recent history of some of the ones that we know about from Columbine to Sandy Hook. But the big point I want to make here is that since 1992 there have been 387 U.S. school shootings, which is, is, is really large. There's a long history of it and hopefully uh, through this conversations that we keep having we will try to adjust uh, this. Next slide please. Some uh, major causes of school violence um, are due to bullying, and that was shown at Columbine in 99. Uh, some others that we haven't seen necessarily here in the U.S., but in Russia uh, through terrorist attacks. And uh, there's a lot of history of uh, mental health school violence at Virginia Tech, Sandy Hook, and at uh, Chardon, Ohio in 2012. And one might argue that all three of these um, are related to mental health issues that we need to get involved in. Next slide. Uh, this uh, graphic um, is from a national institute, and it really just talks about school bullying. If you'll hit the next button, uh, it talks about one out of four students are abused by other youths. Um, one out of five admit to being a bully or doing some sort of bullying. And then every seven minutes a child is bullied at school, on the way to school, in a schoolyard, or some form or fashion. So it's, it's a huge issue nationwide, not only related to the mental health issues, but bullying is a, is a huge proponent and an example of, of why some of these shootings happen. Next slide. Uh, this graphic uh, really um, looks at three areas, the red bar being the high school, middle school, and green, and, and the teal is the primary school, and looking at different um, ways that we secure our schools. And you can see in the upper portion, it talks about the use of security cameras, and those are very highly used, uh, more so in high schools. Um, I think um, just because the age of the students and the, the bullying is at a higher level in the high schools. In the middle graphic, it talks about the percentage of schools reporting controlled access or locked or monitored doors. 
that's much higher in middle schools and elementary schools, and that makes sense because those students are there all day long, whereas high school students are coming and going, going out to lunch, uh, sometimes going to college education programs or work, so it's a more open campus environment. And then the bottom graphic talks about the percentage of schools uh, reporting the use of electronic notification, and that's really even throughout all three. Next slide, please. Uh, what I really want to focus on for the remainder of the presentation are SEPTED principles. Next slide. And that really deals with crime prevention through environmental design. I know a lot of school districts, including um, Ohio School Design Manual, references these standards. But SEPTED is based on the theory that the proper design and effective use of the built environment can lead to a reduction in the inc incidence and fear of crime and an improvement in the quality of life. And their, their strategies are really site specific. I mean, they can be used on any site, uh, elementary school to high school and even college uh, uh, level, and can be applied to new and existing projects. Next slide. Uh, the SEPTED theory uh, really deals with the arrangement and the design of the buildings and open spaces. And this can encourage or discourage undesirable behavior and criminal activity. And through the use of this design theory, it's possible to reduce the opportunities for crime and the disorderly behavior by changing the physical environment around us. And we'll see some examples of that uh, on the next few slides. Next slide. Some of the goals of SEPTED um, really deal with reducing opportunities for crime to occur. Obviously, that's, that's one of the biggest issues. Uh, reducing the fear in the students and the faculty and even the parents making everyone feel at ease, uh, improving the quality of life, and providing opportunities for positive social interaction. Next slide. And then the overall emphasis that we've kind of discussed so far is improving the physical environment, uh, creating a more productive use of space, and enhancing uh, the behavior of people. Next slide. There are really four SEPTED principles, uh, natural surveillance, access control, territoriality, and maintenance. And all of those work together to almost to form puzzle pieces. And they work in conjunction with other security measures that you'll have in place. Next slide. The first one I want to talk about is natural surveillance. And, and the word really explains itself. Natural surveillance is the physical ability to see what's going on in and around your school. If you have solid walls or solid fences or barriers that people can't see through, then there are obviously issues. People can hide behind bushes, can hide behind walls, and, uh, and create some um, issues with bullying and, and other items like that. And uh, openness. Um, Obviously, seeing through things can allow you to see what's going on behind um, uh, walls, behind fences, etc. Next slide. This is uh, an open entry. One of the, one of the items that we design in our school facilities is just an open entry, so so uh, the administration can see who's approaching the school. In this picture, you can see lots of windows. Um, the windows on the left are the administration area, so every administrator has a view to the parking lot and who's approaching the facility. And as you approach the building, there's lots of glass to see who's approaching. So if someone were, were walking up the steps, um, maybe with a gun or something like that, you would be able to see them coming much quicker than with a more closed facility. Next slide. Uh, here's a plan view of natural surveillance in action. You can see um, a long sidewalk entering to the school. The red arrows uh, that are shown now point from the direction of the administrator looking out. The next arrow that popped up is seeing that staff can see all the way around the school. Uh, next arrow. Uh, this provides, this long sidewalk will provide a strong visual connection between staff and approaching people. 
and provide a good distance for observing people approaching and creating an uncomfortable approach for those with malintent. So just having that distance between the school door and the parking lot allows everyone more time to react. And that's really what this is all about, is having enough time for someone to make a call to first responders, lock doors, put the school on lockdown, etc. Time is of the essence. Next slide. This is another example in this, in this picture you see a view of a media center and that arrow just shows the media center director's location and the next arrow shows our actual secure entry vestibule. On the other side of the hallway is the administration. So this uh, media center is really pulling uh, a duty just like the administration seeing who's coming into the school facility, seeing who is at the front door in that locked security vestibule. And this person also has the ability to put the school on lockdown through a push button system. Next slide. Another example of natural surveillance is a signage for one. Um, letting people know, and this kind of goes along with territoriality, letting people know that this is a school and unless you're here to do school duties or go to school or teach here, you shouldn't be here. Um, the next arrow shows an open fence and gate and that is um, allowing us to see through to the school. Had this been a solid fence, uh, we wouldn't even be able to see the school building, but that gate is also there to shut the school facilities after hours to let people know that this is not a location that you can go skateboarding or, or parking your car after hours or anything like that. Next slide. This is an example of an open corridor idea where um, a teacher can simply walk out of their classroom, see from one end to the school, uh, from the other end. In this example, lockers were not put into this high school. Um, it was a, an issue with a previous students, so they decided to take the lockers out. So that really cleans up the corridor and allows people to see um, from one end to the other. Next slide. This is another example of an open corridor or an open commons area and designing the open corridors to have good light so you can see well where teachers again can see um, all the entrances at once and be able to lock those entrances down quickly. Next slide. This is something that we've incorporated into some of our elementary schools. It was a specific request of one of our clients and we really like it and it's bringing the sinks and the hand dryers out of the restrooms themselves. So um, having no doors on the restroom so you can hear what's going on with students. Um, you can quickly walk in and see what's going on with students but then not having the sinks and the hand dryers in there makes them get out quicker. Uh, another positive is the, the teachers can see them wash their hands. But I will tell you one of the negatives that we found is having the hand dryers in the corridor with lots of uh, hard surfaces really carries. But in the case of this district, they didn't care. Uh, there was more of a benefit uh, to having that outside than inside. Next slide. So going on from natural surveillance into access control, and again, the the name really explains itself. Uh, natural access control limits the opportunity for crime by taking steps to clearly differentiate between public space and private space by selectively placing entrances and exits, fencing, lighting, and landscaping to limit access. Next slide. This is an example of a secure entry vestibule. Uh, to the left is uh, the administration or receptionist for the elementary school. To the right is the secure entry vestibule. And across that secure entry vestibule, across that hallway, you can see more uh, windows. And that's actually the media center again. Same concept as the other media center we talked about where you really have um, the administration and the media looking and seeing what's going on in the facility. But just having those locked secure entry doors where someone has to come in, be buzzed into the administration, get their ID tag, and then buzzed into the school allows more time uh, for people to put the school on lockdown, just slows everything down. Next slide. 
another example of a secure entry vestibule at a high school. Um, a much larger entry vestibule. This school houses over 2,500 students, so we needed a much larger vestibule. But again, the same concept. Lots of glass so you can see who's approaching administration right off the secure entry vestibule. And you know, this seems really commonplace, but I've actually toured uh, some 21st century schools when I was in Vancouver in Seattle uh, this past October and a few of those schools did not have secure entry vestibules, which really surprised me. Um, great 21st century learning environments, but still this concept of creating this uh, secure entry vestibule is not being used everywhere. Next slide. This, this photo is actually at the back of a high school off of the student parking lot. So, with high schools you have many entries, not just the front entrances that we've seen earlier where you can put a secure entry vestibule, but you have students coming in and out all day long. So this was our idea of solving the issue of someone just being able to enter the school grounds. Again, we have open fencing, but we have that series of locked doors. So a student can use their ID card on the other side to get out, but on the to um, exit you have the panic hardware just like you would on a normal door but this is designed in a way so someone cannot reach around the fence and gain entry, but students can come and, and teachers can come and flow easily using their ID cards. Next slide. And as many of you know that design schools and maintain schools, um, we can do everything possible to create the secure entries and lock doors and access control, but it really is up to the school in the end not to prop doors open and leave doors unlocked during school hours. Even with the schools I design, I can go back, uh, and I have gone back many times and just walked right into the building. So it really is up to the school itself to uh, help secure it. Next slide. Some of the older schools, um, early 1900s and even as early as the 60s, 70s, and 80s, um, had administration more toward the center of the school, not at the front entrance. You would walk into the entry, walk down a corridor, and really be in the heart of the school before anyone would say anything to you because you're on your way to the uh, administration office. As we redesign these schools, um, this is an example of the administration being in the center. Um, but as we redesign them, we purposefully bring them back up front. Next slide. And this is showing that that area in green bringing the administration back up front and now creating that secure entry vestibule that someone has to uh, walk into, get buzzed into the administration, check in, and then enter the facility. Again, creating more time for someone to uh, put the school on lockdown. Next slide. And this is a blow-up view of that slide that we just showed. Um, again, entering the vestibule, checking in, and then getting your credentials to enter the building. Next slide. Um, taking it a step further from not just creating a secure entry vestibule, but uh, creating some bulletproof glazing. Uh, there is a district here in Oklahoma that's done that on their new schools and is retrofitting some schools. Um, as you recall, Sandy Hook had the secure entry vestibule. The person shot through it and then just simply walked through the door. Um, obviously, we cannot address all issues like that. We Again, the idea is to create as many barriers as we can between the front door and the students uh, to get everyone, give everyone time to get on lockdown. Um, the obvious negative to this is the cost. Um, there are things we'll talk about here in a second from bulletproof glazing to um, vinyl that you could put over the windows to help, um, but obviously those cost a lot of money and it's up to the individual district to decide what's best for their students. Next slide. Uh, this is a concept that we're using where we create a much larger secure entry vestibule and create a reception within it. Um, this is good for a couple of reasons. It allows someone to stay in that entry vestibule without being buzzed in. There's seating available for them. You can see there's a conference room directly to the left that they could easily go into and not go into the main school. 
And this also uh, keeps people from hearing what's going on. There's a lot of talk between teachers and administrators and students going on within a, an administrative office, and sometimes you don't want everyone to hear that. So that kind of controls that as well. And then that blue line um, shows the bulletproof glazing that could be added should you want to uh, take the next step and, and make it as secure as possible. Next slide. Uh, this is just an example of some glass and glazing that can be put in from laminated glass to polycarbonate glass. Uh, there are really eight standards for bullet resistant security. Schools, banks, convenience stores are typically covered in levels one through three. Uh, but this is very expensive to do something like this. Um, there is bullet resistant window film that can be used in existing buildings for retrofit. Um, again, it's not perfect. It does slow things down. It's less expensive than the bulletproof glazing, uh, but it is expensive. Next slide. And then again, of course, we all know classroom, exterior door light, access control is needed at the front door. It's needed at the classroom door so the, the school could be put on lockdown. The individual classrooms could be put on lockdown. Um, I think this is something that everyone understands. Next slide. Territoriality. Um, it, again, territorial reinforcement promotes social control through increased definition of space. Next slide. And it's an en environment designed to clearly delineate private space, and it does two things. First, it creates a sense of ownership that you're supposed to be there, and second, um, it creates an environment where strangers or intruders stand out. You want people to look like they're not supposed to be there. Next slide. And you do that by putting signage up. Every school has signage, security notices, all visitors must check in here, even putting some rules up so people can see what the rules are. That's more about after hours as well, so people know that I'm not supposed to be here between the hours of 8 and 5 or after school hours, things like that. Next slide. Uh, this is an idea we've used on a large high school. Um, as you can see from the graphic, it's had many additions over its 50-year lifespan. It's a, a school for 2,500 students, and to have one administration area in one location just didn't work. So we're dispersing um, administration throughout the facility. That allows vice principals to get to an incident quicker than being in one location. And again, this is really up to the individual district to decide if this is a good idea or not. Obviously, this doesn't promote collaboration between uh, the principals and the vice principals, but it does help with the security aspect. Next slide. And maintenance is the final item, um, and that's just taking care of your facility. Next slide. I hate to say that these pictures were taken in Oklahoma City Public Schools. Um, uh, these issues are being fixed, but the idea here is if there's graffiti, um, broken windows, that if the district's not taking care of the facility, why, are the, why would the students take care of the facility? Next slide. SEPTED principles are also found in FEMA guidelines. If you haven't read this primer, it's um, how to design safe schools in case of terrorist attacks and school shootings. It's very long and lengthy, but all the um, items that we've talked about are addressed in this uh, FEMA uh, series. Next slide. And in conclusion, um, SEPTED principles are part of architectural design. Um, we've talked about the electronic security system, and then of course the security staff, the policies and the procedures of the school and the district. All these work together to form an overall school security program. And not one item is good without the other. I think they should all be used in conjunction with one another, and they all play off one another. Next slide. Next slide. And that concludes uh, my presentation as far as school security goes, and we'll open it up for questions and answers. All right, let's just keep moving along here. Got a few things we need to do before we get to the questions. And just as a reminder to those who are looking for um, the excuse me, CEUs, um, please hang in there. You need to wait for the very last slide that indicates that the webinar has 
has concluded. Otherwise, um, unfortunately, you will not be issued credit. Um, again, after it is over, please email me at sue.meyer at ofcc.ohio.gov. Not right this minute, but please wait till the end. And um, for those of you who may wish to contact the, the uh, presenters directly, you may do so at these addresses. And in the meantime, we are going to be looking for our questions. Hold on a second. And I'm not finding any. All right, so let's try. Here we go. All right, so I'm not finding any. OK, here is a question for us. Are you aware of any best practices which can be used to train the staff member responsible for buzzing people in? Hmm. I am Gary? not. I, yeah, this is Gary. I'm not aware of best practices for training staff. Um, I know each individual school district that we work with has their own. One of the things that we hope to accomplish with the Oklahoma School Security Commission, and we did accomplish in one way, was to form uh, through our Department of Homeland Security, um, sort of a not. It's it's a location that students that. Uh, can report issues that teachers can go to to learn best practices and first responders can go to for training. Uh, that has been given to our um, Department of Homeland Security here in Oklahoma, but the program has not been implemented. So at least here in Oklahoma, we've talked about it. Uh, we're trying to form that, but it has not been formed yet. All right, thank you. Um, next question for you, Gary. At Mustang High School, how were student belonging ha belongings handled without lockers? Uh, they have books in their classrooms, and they also carry are allowed to carry backpacks. Um, they are going to eventually go to a one-to-one -one initiative where um, students would have electronics, iPads, or uh, laptops available to them. Um, so it was in it's kind of it was a precursor to that in preparation for that one-to-one -one initiative. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Our next question is, how do you lock down an open space or pod? Okay, and, that, and that's difficult. Um, I've been to, uh, I was at a school recently in Seattle that was an absolute perfect example of 21st century learning. Had the pod concept, they had a lot of glass, and really that was the first question I asked as I was touring the school. And in the case of this school, uh, they had an area where they had distributed their um, food service areas, and they had that wrapped around in the center of the pod. So students were uh, told to go to that food service area or their serving line area and the kitchen area, and they locked down in that as it was central to them. If there's not a, a location like that, I've been in other schools where uh, there are storage rooms uh, for the teachers in between classrooms. Those can be used. And just simply having a classroom lock and having a plan of attack, or bad choice of words, a plan in place uh, for the students to go into a corner out of sight is the best example that we can give at this time. Gary, um, this is Melanie Trapp, and I just wondered, I've seen a lot of instances where there's suites of rooms where there is a set of doors that you actually have to enter to get into the suite. So could part of the lockdown procedure there be uh, locking down the doors yes. that go into the suite? Yes, I've seen that. I'm th thanks for bringing that up. Um, that's one that I'd forgotten about. I, I've seen and used that myself, um, and I've actually seen it used where uh, the lockdown button actually closes those doors. They're almost like fire doors, if you will, uh, but there are, their main reason is to um, inhibit access into those pods. So yes, that's, that is a good point and has been used many times. I think a key thing there is, is making sure it's hooked up to the lockdown or panic button systems. So with one simple push of a button, you don't have to have someone, a teacher, go out and shut those doors with the push of a button. They close automatically. Yeah, this is Frank Locker. Let me jump in. Um, I showed a number of examples of pods. Um, every one of them had a set of entry doors that could have been closed in the manner that, that Gary's just outlining. Um, it's also possible to do those doors as completely solid doors held open 
uh, with magnetic catches so that when the lockdown procedure does happen, there's that they're absolutely a, a solid barrier. Um, and, and that's what I was referring to, Frank. They're, they're sort of like uh, fire doors that are always held open and uh, as with magnetic hold open devices. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, the, the key on those, of course, is to uh, have awareness that the intruder is in the building, uh, be able to control them mechanically or electronically, uh, and having others along the way who, who know the presence of, of that intruder. Um, I do have a school in um, Battle Creek uh, that has a different concept. The, 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 the small learning communities or the pods do not have um, separate, you know, closable entry doors into them, but they do have, I would say, that six classrooms arranged around each one of them. The classrooms do have a door and they have a glass view panel uh, that goes from about three foot um, from the floor to you know, standard door height, six foot eight, and they're maybe 12 foot wide. Um, in each of the classrooms, they have solid panels that are permanently located directly below the windows, so that it's uh, you know uh, so that if you wanted to take those rooms and visually separate them from the the pod itself from the breakout space, you lift the panels and snap them into place. Uh, mm -hmm. That way, students would be visually sheltered and, and an intruder wouldn't know which one of the rooms they might be in. Uh, there's also a, you know, because of the three foot high uh, sill height, there's a crouch down space uh, in each of the classrooms. Perfect. Thank you, gentlemen and Melanie. Next question. Um, thank you. This has been a valuable presentation. Will the PowerPoint be available for download? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, once the webinar concludes and sometime within the next five days. The recording of the webinar and the PowerPoint will be made available on the OFCC webinar archive. Uh, attendees will receive an email letting them know when that resource is available. Next question. Uh, this is addressed to Gary. How do you address the concerns of law enforcement, concerns about wrapping large spaces with glass, for example, media center, student dining, uh, being concerned about large groups of students as visible targets for an active shooter. Yeah, um, we've had those discussions with law enforcement, and um, I have a lot of friends that are law enforcement, so don't take what I'm saying wrong. But their idea of school security is to truly uh, make it prison-like, to not have the glass. Um, we all know that students are in there to learn. And with the 21st century learning principles that Frank talked about, it's just not feasible to have schools designed like well, what I grew up in. Um, so we just have the conversation with them and, and, to, and show them um, ideas and examples like this and, and talk about ways like the secure entry vestibules, the panic buttons, the, uh, the doors in the corridors that can lock down. Um, once we started talking to them about those type of ideas, they could see where we were coming from, I could see where they were coming from, and we could kind of meet in the middle to uh, find some, some good solutions to this. So they're really usually easily uh, to talk to. You just have to get on board with them early. All right, thank you. Next question. What if a school uses the ALICE security system? What was that again? What if the school uses the ALICE, capital A, capital L, I, C, E? I'm not familiar with that. I, I'm, I'm thinking it's a security um, procedures uh, protocol. Um, I'm not familiar with it myself, but um, I suppose we could look into that and uh, get back to the person who asked that question. Okay, yeah, I'll look into it. All right. Thank you very much. Has there been any discussion on installing emergency roll-down gates to limit an intruder from entering into the student space? Uh, we haven't done that, and typically um, fire department personnel are against roll-down gates. We're having that discussion right now uh, on some restrooms that, where we put roll-down gates. So typically the fire department is against that type of thing because you, once the gate's down, I can't exit through it anymore. I can't, there's no panic hardware. I'd have to, to raise it and it requires special procedures to raise it back up. So we have not um, used that. All right, thank you. 
Um, let's see if we have another question here. Um, any experiences regarding preschool and kindergarten or art room exterior doors? Um, well, I think nationally, if I know in Oklahoma that we are required to have pre-K, kindergarten exterior doors directly from the classroom uh, for exit purposes on the first floor. Um, and obviously those, um, and in the cases of ours, they're usually solid because there's already exterior windows present to let light in, so there's no need for us to have uh, glass in it, but there's uh, always a, a classroom uh, lock on it that people can't enter from the outside in, into the uh, classroom. All right, thank you. Um, we have received some information from one of our attendees regarding Alice. Um, it's a reaction procedure outlined for handling an intruder. It's been adopted in many schools and does play an important role in school security. Hmm. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right, well, I am, this is the end of the questions for today. And we want to thank everybody for coming. So let me get to the last slide so that everybody knows that this is the official end of the webinar. So if you're interested in receiving a credit of any time, either for self-reporting or for AIA, please send me an email, sue.meyer at ofcc.ohio.gov with your AIA number and request for credit. Thank you for joining us today.